Awesome. Welcome everybody to Zetabytes today uh, Lunch and Learns. Today's featuring our, one of our co-founders, Rini Das, on user adoption. My name is Vinny Sanfilippo. I'm also a co-founder here. Um, and just welcome to our Lunch and Learn series. Um, there's no pressure to, to interact or respond or any of that, although we welcome um, you too. Um, this is just a, a thing we're doing here for the community to make sure that we're all sharing our knowledge and can be helpful towards one another. Um, that being said, if you'd like what you see and you want to become a Zeta star, which gives you all kinds of different perks for ZetaBytes.today, um, we are running a promo for the month of Pride where it is 66% off. So feel free to um, look at that. I think believe that it is $23 to join right now. So feel free to hop on there if you like what you see. You get access to events and Rini will buy your drinks whenever we have one. So, <laughs> um, so that being said, I'd love to turn it over to Rini to teach us about user adoption. Take it sure. away. Awesome. Um, I cannot, I, I right now have the PowerPoint screen, so I will not be able to see you guys, um, you know, participate. Um, just a, a laundry list of things. Um, Robin is going to post some questions. There'll be two questions that will be posted on the chat. So Ethan and Eileen and anybody else who has just joined, um, if you want to respond to those questions, uh, I have some references that also Robin is going to post those links on the chat thread. So this is for you guys to follow up with it. Uh, we are doing the recording because we have started a, a exclusive, uh, actually private YouTube channel, and we're going to post this so that in case you want to go back to it, you know, we can talk about it. So um, actually what I'm going to talk about today is give a quick overview in my experience as to what user experience means um, and how do we actually, um, you know, what are the variables that drive user experience. So um, one other uh, note out here, um, I'm a managing principal of RD Management Consulting Inc. Uh, this company was formed uh, 20 plus years ago. Um, we do management consulting. I hire a lot of people in to do some of these gigs. And in the middle, I also did a tech startup, uh, several of them. So that's what I do for a living. So user experience is my passion um, because without users or customers, you know, it's all meaningless. So what we have is that if you're, we're gonna focus mostly on software applications, website, digital experiences, and then a typical, you know, features of that, as all of you know, you know, you need to have access and security, which is, you know, the login and logout feature, or sign in and sign out, however you want to call them, home landing page, you know, where they land, um, if, they have, if it's a video gaming environment or, uh, you know, any of the augmented reality stuff, then it's a play environment, or you actually added a data, you have sort of the viewing or the experience, you have search feature, you have analytics, you have health feature, notification alerts, you know, any kind of personalization that you want to give as features, and also some front end, you know, system administration that you want to do specially in software as a service um, kind of an environment. So when we have these types of features, one of the most important thing that we have to talk about is what really is important to customer experience or user experience. And for that, um, there is something known as the Kano model. And there are some references um, among which um, uh, one of them, uh, Robin is going to post it on the chat page. Um, so the way this Kano model works and uh, Vinny and Robin will tell you that I talk about this all the time because anything in my world, you know, is kind of categorized in three ways which means um, you have dissatisfiers or must-haves. These are features where if you don't have it, then you're extremely dissatisfied. But if you have it, then it doesn't increase your satisfaction, okay? So an example of that is um, once upon a time, I used to travel about 36 to 48 weeks a year and staying in hotels were very important to me. And not having a clean bed or um, clean towels, you know, um, was a huge dissatisfier or a must have. And having it did not make me be more satisfied, right? So that's the type of example. So if you have 
If you don't have a login or a sign in or a sign out feature, then that is a must have feature. It's when you don't have it, then it's a dissatisfier. If you have it, it doesn't increase your satisfaction. These are also features by which if you, again, if you don't have those features, then you won't survive in the marketplace. So um, that's what we call, you know, is one part of the world for me. The other one is more is better, which means um, the more you give that particular feature, the better it is. So for example, if you're building analytics platform, the more canned reports you can give, the better it is. Um, so those are typically called satisfiers. And then you have what is known as delighters, right? So this is um, something that was unexpected and you built in a feature. So when somebody got in there, you know, they discovered it and they're extremely thrilled with it. So it not only applies to software, it applies to you know everything. Um, Vinny has uh, probably heard me use the word delight is all the time, you know? So my world is that, you know, these are the three ways I see the world. And any conversation I have, you know, anything people are complaining about, I always categorize like, you know, if it's a must have, I need to address right away. If it's a delighter issue, then I need to work on it to increase, you know, some amount of work there. So this is how all the features that I mentioned it, and that you give user experience, you know, this is where we actually decide on what is the minimum value product is going to look like and everything that we design looks like. So then the other thing I want to talk about is, um, and there's a huge literature about this, which is um, customer success. So every work process that you're working on, um, think about what you do for a living. Every work process that you're working on is a uh, you know is dedicated towards at some point to customer success that's the process of increasing customer satisfaction and customer effort is score um, is a way to calibrate you know the effort it takes the customer to for example learn to use the product or service that you're providing get an issue resolved get a request have a question answered and um we are going to have um, Robin put in a question, the first question for you. I mean, think about when we had, you know, examples of um, epic fail. Um, I remember like during when the pandemic hit, you know, all the airlines, you know, um, were canceling their flights and you had to, I, I literally remember we had uh, some uh, tickets from, um, with Cathay Pacific. Um, and I was seven hours on the phone, just their music running and couldn't lose my spot. Um, and they did not have a feature where they call you back. Seven hours. So that's the effort that I had to put in to cancel my tickets. Um, there are many ways to kind of measure um, this customer success, but most important thing is that awareness is critical. Questions? So this brings us, you know, um, to what in my experience in the last 30 years of designing experiences, designing software, um, helping people, you know, design new process changes or any kind of changes that people introduce in policies and anything else. Um, in my experience, it's Y is a function of X. And before everybody, you know, gets all tied up in a knot, with respect to algebra. Let me just explain what that means, okay? Y is a function of X. Um, y is always uh, the variable Y in English. All it means is it's a lagging indicator. There are things in this world that you have absolutely no control over. It just kind of happens. And user experience is one of them. It's a lagging uh, indicator, which means the user will experience whatever they experience. We have to understand, that's why it's a function of X, which is all these X variables, which means these are all the leading indicators that we can control. So there are a lot of things that we can control or we can help the user and the customer manage that by addressing those issues. So we cannot control user experience because that's the output that comes out but we can control definitely all these X variables. So for example, 
there are two factors, main big drivers there. One is the user themselves, and the other one is user adoption. And um, then the third one is basically looking at user engagement. And in there, we have the user interface and also the user themselves. So in user adoption, you know, before everyone again gets tied up in a knot with respect to, you know, I have to do the math thing. So there are all these X numbers that are listed there. And all that means in English is when we talk about user adoption, there are several things. One is the user interface, and I'll talk about it a little bit uh, in the next slide. And then we have the user, and we'll talk about it in the next slide. So let's talk about the user interface, right? A typical bad design will have all kinds of things. One is they will have non-intuitive navigation, right? Which means people cannot find anything. Um, I'm old enough to remember when Microsoft Office decided to completely move from how they had this top menu to something like a ribbon thing. And by that time, almost all Microsoft Office users, like in PowerPoint and Word, were using it for like 10, 15 years. And when they completely changed the interface and would not let you revert back to what the old stuff was, it was an absolute nightmare because intuition happens with habit. So if you have, you know, icons that you just put in there, most people are not going to navigate those icons thinking, you know, oh, let me check out what this means. What they want to do is they come in, they want to do a task and go away. And if it is completely non-intuitive to them, that means they have never seen it before, then it becomes a huge issue. Um, I've seen websites in every place uh, put in either no search ability, you know, the magnifying glass, or they have um, very bad search capabilities um, in the sense the algorithm behind it. So typically, you know, what developers do is, you know, they'll go to GitHub and they will just, you know, steal some search routine and put it in there. Um, in my experience, you know, Google search is probably the best, you know, um, search algorithm because it will generate, you know, anything in your app or design some of those capabilities. Uh, sources where, you know, the information button is there and everything associated with it are extremely unclear in many things. Unclear features, ad editing doesn't work, inconsistency in labels and icons and all those other things. And I don't want to deep dive into lean design right now, but I can tell you this. One of my biggest peeves of a bad user interface is when people give too many options to the user to do the same task which means sometimes they will have the word add there as a feature and then they'll also have create then they'll you know have for example update versus save they'll have edit versus edit icon so all these different ways and processes and icons you know creates much more confusion and also uses up all the real estate on um you know on the virtual screen so user interface um really drives user adoption. So ease of accessing the tool, again, is a customer effort. If your tool is on the phone and not an app, like you're calling the call center, how long you wait you know, to get in is measuring your customer effort. People are not going to come back if it takes too long to get in. I have seen um, join up screens where they're asking so much information that you know nobody is going to join up if they have to give so much information in. So these are the types of things that you have to take into consideration. And again, user interface drives user adoption. So how fast, you know, how easily can I navigate? How you know, intuitively is the uh, interface that is there? Um, something else that many of us use is called um, usability testing. This is what I call as when you make your lead developer weep. Um, and I have done that before. I usually get a um, lot of um, users, you know, sign up to try out our alpha testing. It's part of your sprint routine if you're using Agile. Um, and essentially give them tasks. And then just like, you know, we are using WebEx or Zoom, 
we record all their um, mouse movements, um, you know, how are they navigating and how they're trying to do their task without any instructions. And then I make them watch those hour long videos. And trust me, I've had lead developers weep, screaming at the user virtually, saying, you know, why would the user do that? I mean, that's not what it was designed for. So I think that type of you know testing um, upfront really gives a lot of information that is helpful to the user interface uh, part of it. Um, again, intuitiveness of the user interface. Um, how do you design it and everything else? The next thing, what I call is the darn users, right? If only they would behave the way you want them to behave, they would adopt faster. So um, among them are users' learning styles. Um, many of you who have designed anything, okay, one of the uh, um, methodologies or methods of understanding the user is building user personas, which essentially means that whatever you're creating or whatever change you're implementing, it may not be a completely a virtual environment. It might be a change in policy. So you're com communicating as a change manager a policy. You have to understand what your users' learning styles are. A um, lot of software these days and apps these days have not been designed for senior users. Um, you know, they don't take into account, you know, that senior users are getting, you know, they have cell phones too, and they have apps too, and they, you know, um, sort of flat finger, you know, um, apps. They cannot put in certain things, um, certain things, and they're not used to it. So it is very important to understand who your pers user persona is, uh, or at least a modal user persona, and understand their learning style. So you can actually make a difference in the user's learning curve by giving them things that are easier for them to adapt. Uh, same with disability um, use, it dis uh, people with disabilities. You know, so you, if that's your core user, you have to figure out how to address their issues. Um, also, you know, you need to understand in your user persona, you know, what kind of user past experiences, their ability to troubleshoot, you know, um, for some reason, people think because I work on computers, my ability to troubleshoot is like intuitive. Sometimes it is and sometimes it's not, but most users do not know how to troubleshoot. Um, their digital savvy is also you know, very important in those things. Uh, hardware needs. Um, sometimes in corporate world, you know, if the, um, you get 100% adoption because it's a mandated use. It's like, it's not like you cannot do anything. So I think the business needs are important. It is very important to understand the underlying business process where the app is sitting. Um, I can give you an example where um, a few decades ago uh, for a very large pharmaceutical company, um, they spent, you know, a few, you know, seven figure, I mean, high seven figure numbers to develop this sales app for their um, pharmaceutical sales reps who pretty much live in the car, right? I mean, that's what they do. They drive to places and they sell pharmaceuticals. And um, this app was built and they had, their potential users were something around close to 2000 users within their um, company. And literally two people were using, two salespeople were using it. So when I was helping with their project, I asked the whole development team, does, has anybody like spent a day with the sales rep in their car to see and understand how they work? And they said, no. So I said, this is what we're going to do. We are going to spend, you know, we dispatch some of these developers and designers to go and sit in the car with the sales rep all day long and watch them how they do their work. And then they came with all the information they had, they came back and we had a whole day meeting where they, the developers and users discussed like the existing app that they built that nobody was using, would that be any use, any way useful 
to the sales rep in the current condition. And 100% of them said impossible. It doesn't work with how they do their work. So how are you going to get user adoption if you don't understand the underlying business uh, process? The other thing I would like to say is customer effort involves consistency and trust. So for example, let me show you this. This is one of my favorite design, Google search. The best part I like about it is all the white space and just one bar because you have only one task here. You're going to type in something, right? But what is most important, um, again, I'm old enough to remember when there was once upon a time, a major fight between all the different search routines, okay? Um, and probably Robin can remember, you know, we used to have Netscape and Alta, Alta something, I forget the, what the, Alta search, and then Yahoo search, and there were all these search routines, and Google won. The reason Google won is, I still remember the first day I used Google, that was, you know, something like 1995 or something like that. And I typed in a word and it gave me things in return that actually what I wanted to see in my search. Nobody else did that. Like you had to scroll through everybody else's search to find the thing that you were looking for. So this immediately, created a sense of trust. So user adoption is based on trust. If I go into an app expecting certain things right off the bat, and you give that to me right away, then I have established a trust. So even though there is nothing else here on the Google search page, I know that when I type in something, the very first page will return results that pretty much answers what, what I'm looking for. So that is the most critical thing, and that only comes with alpha and beta testing in product development you know, going forward. So going back here, user adoption, remember these things, the damn darn users and the user interface. These are the two big categories, but also their computer use, usage de demographics, the business needs, and the learning curve. Um, another quick example of um, you know, value for the user, especially corporate users, um, when we were having you know, sort of these warehouses, enterprise data warehouses that we were building, so that not every user touches you know, the raw data, it was very hard for people not to download information on their computers and work on Excel. Excel has been completely, um, you know, because people are comf comfortable with Excel, so they will download and they will play in it. It doesn't matter, you know, if you put, you know, great analytics tools, you know, out there, they are going to download the data. So how do you make them adopt? you know, with all the SAP implementations and ERM implementations that many of you have gone through within your organization. Um, these are enterprise data warehouses and enterprise data apps, um, you know, Salesforce, all of those things. Older users will use Excel. They will download stuff and work on Excel. And if you want them not to use that, you have to figure out, you know, how to address that change. And that's how you're going to get user adoption. The next thing, and I'm going to go a little bit faster because um, I want to do get some answers from all of you. Just as user adoption goes, the other thing is user engagement. And again, the two main drivers are users themselves and the user interface. And in these, like for example, in user interface, you have aesthetics. Um, how many of you can name off the bat, you know, there are a lot of apps and uh, especially bank apps um, or financial services apps that have terrible aesthetics, right? Uh, because, you know, they were not, the idea was that you will just get in there and you know transfer money or do something but you know they didn't really care about 
a whole lot about branding, you know, because they didn't want to spend money on it. But I think aesthetics do matter if you want to increase user engagement. Um, also, digital user support. Um, I know that ChatGPT and you know any of these generative AI is becoming very popular, and they put these chat things out there. But I think in this digital user support, you also have easy ways to navigate help screens, right? If you type in in your help a question, don't give the user 15 million you know responses with those words. So it, how you do to help them navigate to get support is critical for user engagement. Um, refresh speed, connectivity speed, these are important things for user engagement. You have also, you know, fun features, right? I mean, um, long time ago, and I think Zendex was the first one that did it, or maybe it was MailChimp, which is if you accidentally went to a sign, you know, a, a website or a web page which no longer exists, and typically everybody would just say, oh, 404 error. I mean, many of you may, might have seen that. And um, they would do this, uh, I know MailChimp does that, they, their icon is a monkey, and they would have the monkey like, you know, slap its head and, you know, say, oops, you know, this is what happened, this is monkey business, the page has gone, so it was like a fun factor, and it really like, you know, it, it didn't annoy the user as much as it would have. Um, the other thing is reward features or, you know, creating fear of missing out factors. Um, this is where nudging of behaviors, this is an entire, you know, you can get a master's degree in gamification. Um, those of you who don't know, um, I spent 10 years of my life building a gamification SaaS and managing that. So um, this is again a topic very near and dear to my heart. Um, a perfect example of gamification things um, and, you know, what I call sticks and carrots. Um, example was actually in um, Sweden. They were trying to, um, when you're driving, you've seen these things where it says, you know, slow down and then it would read your speed and read it back to you telling you you're in a you know 25 zone and your speed is 42 with the intent that you slow down and as i found out recently i was in uh, spain as i found out they actually don't even have cops on the road they just have cameras and after i came back from spain i got two speeding tickets um, because they just take you know that's they use the stick method to, I didn't reduce my speed, but I did get a ticket because I guess their intent is to make money out of it. But if you want people to reduce um, the thing, the best one I heard was in uh, Sweden where they actually said, if you slow down randomly, we will pick your you know, um, license plate number by taking a camera shot and put you in the weekly uh, you know, super lotto. And they had about 100% compliance of people slowing down with that small odd that their, you know, license plate will be put in as somebody who has bought a lot of ticket and win, you know, millions of dollars. So you have to figure out, you know, what these gamification things are, uh, features are there to engage the user so that they keep coming back and also change their behaviors in that space. Um, with respect to user engagement, uh, the users uh, and the darn users, what I call them, is uh, they have to trust the data quality. So if what is given back to them, you know, if you, if they do, if there are errors in it, they're not going to come back. And it's also our patience with the errors, right? If it's not gelling with what is coming back, then they're not going to come back. A um, few weeks ago, for example, we discovered, uh, or a few sessions ago, there was a huge issue that the WebEx password was not going out. We had set up this automated email, and it was not going out. So that is the, you know, luckily some of them came back, and luckily Vinny and Robin came to the rescue. But it's also patience with these errors. If that issue happened the next time, 
no one is going to come back, right? Because they're not going to be spending time trying to log into our system. So these types of things have to be addressed in order to have user engagements. And again, those are sort of must have, you know, things. They are not delighters um, when you have errors, you know, that to deal with. And I know that these days everybody is working on chat GPT. So I will um, quickly tell a story uh, about how long time ago, before, you know, learning algorithms became very popular, um, I have a dishwasher in my office and I got, and it's Maytag, and I got a little postcard saying, call this 1-800 number to schedule, you know, something. Like there was a, there was a problem with some, you know, wiring and they will come and fix it. So I call this 1-800, you know, Maytag number, and it says, if your name is John Doe, then say J-O-H-N-D-O-E, John Doe. So as you know, uh, you know, so I said, my name is Rini Das, R-I-N-I-D-A-S. And it came back saying, if your name is badass, then press one. So in this algorithm, somebody had actually like, you know, what, the, what it was doing is it listens to your sound and then it tries to match to the closest thing as to what they heard with the spelling. And the closest thing prior to that, that the machine had learned was badass. So for future purposes, I am badass. And so, um, but it is important that we use humans to define these learning algorithms when you're trying to provide user support over phone or chat or Twitter or any of the social channels. It's very important to understand consistency and trust is very important to, for user engagement purposes. That said, the last thing I want to discuss is the bell curve of Rogers curve. Uh, also known as Rogers Curve. This was, it came out of, um, in 1962, um, model of innovation. And it was really popularized by the guy who formed um, Intel. He was the founder of Intel, Jeffrey Moore. Many of you who are in the tech world have heard about Moore's Law, which is what we are seeing right now with the Intel factory coming here. But he also wrote a book called Crossing the Chasm. And I think it is extremely important for anybody in tech. Um, it talks about marketing and selling high-tech products, but it talks primarily about user adoption. Um, what he did was, um, Jeff Moore, um, what he did was talk about this curve. You have probably heard that there's always a bell curve of adoption for anything, whether it is adoption of a slight change in policy or a brand new software. It is broken up into five different groups. And the first one, they're called innovators. These are people who like to tinker with you know, stuff. They typically make about 2.5% of your user base. And then there are the early adopters. I, and by the way, some early adopters might adopt to something early, and some they will not care about, right? So these early adopters will, you know, I find like Robin is an early adopter, you know, she will go and, you know, play with it and give feedback and all those kinds of things. You really need them. And you also need them, you know, to make sure that your, you know, your users are adopting. The next one is early majority. This is when everything is getting more or less popular. 34% uh, of your uh, user base are going to be that. Um, you have to figure out how to influence the early majority to become early adopters. So this is where your gamification features becomes very important. How do you mobilize them? You also have a late majority with people who finally, you know, catch up to it. And then you have the 16%, which I call laggards. Those people will never play with you. So don't put them on your sandbox, okay? find them a friend and move the, or move them out. So this happens with any, you know, employee engagement issues. This happens with other things. 
these are laggards. The 16% will never join your game. So this is what you have to do in order to understand, you know, um, y is a function of x. User experience happens. You have to figure out ways to influence those early adopters, and especially the early majority, to become early adopters. And then also, you know, user engagement, figure out how to increase their engagement so they keep coming back um, in order to do those things. And with that, um, I'll have Robin see if you guys answered any of the two questions we put out. Okay, <clears throat> the first question, I didn't get any answers to. I'm going to read it again, and then if people want to put sure. uh, answers in the, the chat, then they can. So the first question is, in your experience, which company or service have you spent the least effort consistently or had a delightful experience? One, learning to use a product or service. Two, to get an issue resolved. Three. A request fulfilled or for a question answered. And so any, any bad experience? Give them give me epic fails. Are we just answering over uh voice? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, well the, some of the big monolithic um companies, even if you have um you know, a tier of uh, licensing, like for Google or Microsoft or something, mm -hmm. it can just be impossible to get in touch with a person. Um, so, you know, you'll have to, and, and I appreciate limited resources and, you know, the size of uh, customer bases and all that, but, you know, often you'll have to navigate really complex support sites. Um, did this answer your question? And frequently it's no, it did not answer my question. I just need to connect with somebody. And so I find the support for really large corporations is often underwhelming. Very true. Every, everywhere. And it's been, I think it has become worse, you know, sort of in the pandemic. It has become worse <laughs> everywhere. Ethan, thoughts? Oh, yeah, I agree. Um, and that's kind of related to my online bank comment. Um, just there's, I write down my password, I'm ready to go. And then I type in my password and it doesn't work for some reason. And then there's a whole, a uh, series of events I have to jump through to get talk to somebody and then reset it manually with them. So hate that. And 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 especially in a work environment where it is mandatory, you know, oh. it's like how much time. I mean, again, customer effort, right? How much time is being wasted, you know, in not doing your work but dealing with this, you know, let's call it crap as we see it, you know. Um, <laughs> Robin, Vinny, Kelsey, any epic fail examples or good ones? I have an epic fail example. Um, uh, the when I've used this my uh, this WebEx product, um, we were hosting a, an event a, a couple months ago, and um, WebEx did not send out a password with the meeting that was generated to us. And it was either a fail on WebEx or a fail on me on CRM or something misfired in one of the softwares that we used right. because they didn't want to play well together. Um, and it resulted in a lot of folks being stuck in a waiting room with no password to put in there and WebEx wouldn't generate or delete the password after the meeting had already started. So um, it was it was a tough user experience for everybody involved. Fortunately, we figured out our, our way around of it, but. It, it, it's my personal belief technology is meant to make, make our lives easier, not cause further frustrations. So yep. that, there's an epic fail example for you. Yep. 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 Absolutely. Let's do the uh, second question. So the second question, question two, what is the best example of helping users learn about the new changes or enhancements uh, to a, a product or software? I said, um, um, a landing page, like different times I logged on something, there's been a landing page that pops up immediately and says, um, here's what's new, like 
you know, we just added this or mm-hmm. this, or this has changed. So it's like, a, it's immediate that, you know, okay, well, something's different and you can choose to go through a tour or you can choose to look up whatever it is. Um, just, but just so you, they know, you, you're letting your users know that something has been changed or updated. Um, Ethan said that he thinks Photoshop does a really good job of explaining new tools in its context. Yeah, so there's a link there, but just like what I like about it is if you're hovering over something that's new, it'll have like a small window that'll explain it. But uh, sometimes with Robin, what you were explaining, sometimes I feel like my I'm going into a product to do a specific thing. And if the app is trying to get me to read a whole thing, I don't really care about it. Um, So what I like about when sometimes it's in context is that I'm only um, reading about it because it's new or because I like actually want to learn about that specific thing. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I think, to Ethan's point, also, um, I think I'd like the feature where it says, don't show me this pop up again. Yeah. yeah, I think that is very important because sometimes, you know, people forget that and they just keep on popping and it's like, it's like swatting flies, you know, like get away from my screen. Yeah, <laughs> you know? most of the ones I've seen have an option where you can just right. sit or, or you can, yes, say don't show yes. me this again. Yeah. And um, I've seen, uh, it, I, I, I don't use the iPhone, but on um, Google Pixel, when they launch a brand new, you know, something, I mean, it ha- happens seldom, but when it when they do, what they have done is in typical Google style, they they just like, it's, it'll last for 10 seconds or so. You know, it will just basically tell you, this is the way you did it and this is the way you can go. Um, you know, and it will just, walk you through like before you even realize you know like you start doing something and it says this is the way it was and now this is the way it's going to be i cannot explain it until i show you you know something that happens but it was very good because it immediately told me that i was you know i could revert back and google always does that they have always given options in the past i don't know whether they'll do that in the future if you didn't like something that they have done, you could revert back to your old ways. I mean, they eventually took it away, but you know, they're famous for their beta testing. Um, those of you who know have used Gmail from the very beginning, you know, when Gmail came out, I think it was the first five years they called it Google, Gmail beta, uh, beta because that's because they were taking in all the data for machine learning to figure out how people navigate before they launched any new pro, you know, feature into their Gmail. Um, so yeah, so there are different, you know, success stories also there, but I think understanding how people learn is very important, especially with, um, you know, I'm finding, you know, our generation and even the, you know, older generation, our parents' generation are going in, you know, you have to understand some of the senior capabilities, especially if you're doing consumer applications right so um how they navigate on the phone you know when you make phone screens smaller and smaller it's very hard with our fingers especially if you know our fingers become less you know nimble if you will to do all those things so you have to understand them um any other examples that you guys think when when you had designed something or you found something where they took into account people's learning abilities? In 2020, uh, I work at the Columbus College of Art and Design, and we had a lot of desire to move from Microsoft Exchange for our email and calendar to Google. Um, So we had the benefit of the desire to change was already there. Um, And we did the change in about a week because it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. And so we benefited from some of that chaos. It was like, well, we don't have a choice. We have to change. Uh Um, But the most difficult thing uh, kind of leading us through that change on the user services side for me was there was a lot of different experience levels 
like not just Rogers Curve, but also you have like faculty that are really technology focused. And then you've uh, got faculty that have been teaching painting for 30 years. And now I'm telling them, okay, well now you have to change over your email and you have to use our learning management system. And they're like, why? Um, well, because all of our classes are online now. So we all have to figure out how to do this differently. So um, I guess what I'm saying is uh, from a support standpoint, like how do we guide our users through this and build trust? The conversations had to look very different. It wasn't just a one size fits all Absolutely. email Absolutely. campaign that said, here's what's gonna happen everybody. Like there had to be a lot of follow up conversations with departments and then individuals as much as we could sustain. And, and also like people who have used Outlook, who use Outlook, love to create folders and save their emails in different folders and trying to explain to them that you have now gone to conversation style. I mean, although Outlook has that feature, it really is not as good as Gmail's conversation style. And so you can just search, you don't have to categorize everything. You know, you can just put in a word and the emails are going to pop up. You don't have to save them in a folder. And it's, it's a huge mind shift, you know? I mean, we have in our household, I, my wife is an Outlook person, and there is absolutely, I mean, I've created Gmail addresses for her. She just refuses to use any Gmail if she can avoid it, you know, because she likes to put things in buckets, you know, in categories, and it, it drives her crazy when I try to tell her, you can just search, you know, you don't have to save everything that way. But yeah, any other questions in the user experience? discussion why is a function of x everybody got that user adoption user engagement two big drivers and for each of them user interface and the user themselves those darn users <laughs> okay that's all i've got that's all she wrote, folks. Happy Pride. Thank you for joining us here today. Um, there will be a recording on YouTube um, later this week for anybody who missed it or if you had friends that you wanted to check out Rini's talk. Um, but thank you for joining us. Become a Zeta star if you haven't already. Um, and we will talk to you all soon. See ya. July 25th, uh, we are having something on product, product management. Jairatu is going to be, Mansare is going to be presenting.